Hi, folks. Thank you for joining me again, Ketamine Clinics of Los Angeles, and our live stream on Facebook. I missed you last week. I was at the AADA conference in San Francisco talking about anxiety and depression with over a thousand psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers, lots of professors. I learned a lot. It was a really remarkable conference. Uh, four days in San Francisco. I didn't see San Francisco at all. I didn't even leave the hotel except for a short dinner on Saturday night. But I did learn a lot and I did get to talk about ketamine and to hear about other people using ketamine. It was terrific. I enjoyed it. Welcome back. We're in uh, our clinic again. And I had a number of topics I wanted to talk about. One of the things was safety. I get questions all the time about how safe is it? Well, ketamine is really safe. Ketamine has an enormous therapeutic index. That's the ratio of the effective dose to the lethal dose. It's really, really enormous. It's very safe. Occasionally, people do need some kinds of support. And in our clinic, we have a full range of supportive measures. In addition to highly trained people, we all have ACLS, all the Clinical people have advanced cardiac life support, and they really know how to use it. We have drills. But in addition to that, we have the right technology. I don't know if you can see this because the camera's kind of close to me, but I have a crash cart here. We call it a crash cart because it has the things that we need if we ever have to support people physiologically or resuscitate them. Uh, this is something that we dust regularly so that it doesn't gather too much dust. We don't want to use it, but we want it to be ready to be used if we need to use it. This includes all kinds of things for supporting an airway. It includes a means of ventilating the patient. I don't know how much you can see. It includes a defibrillator. It includes suction. It includes everything that we would need to support someone whose physio physiology was so deranged that they couldn't support themselves. It also includes all the drugs recommended for resuscitation in these various drawers down here. Um, our crash cart is three years old, and it's never been used. We hope I'll be saying that in 30 years, but we do keep a log. We do make sure that the medicines in it are in date. We do make sure that everyone knows where everything is and how to use it. So the ketamine is safe and the backup support system in the event that anything requires your support from us is also in place. That's nice reassurance. And in over three years, how about how many cases would you say you've done? About how many infusions have you administered? Over 4,000. And you haven't needed to use any of, this, any of that equipment once? Not once. Excellent. Ketamine is safe. At least it's safe acutely. People say, oh, we don't know what the long-term effects are. Well, we don't know what the long, long-term effects are. Ketamine's only been around in clinical use since 1970. That's much longer than all the other drugs that are being used for depression. We don't know what their long-term side effects are either. We do know that short term, when people don't get care, they're miserable, they suffer, sometimes they take their own lives. Then they won't have the benefit of ketamine infusions or anything else. You know, one um, population that uh, we look to take care of are those who suffer from addiction. And obviously, um, that can be self medicating to deal with depression or anxiety or other things. Um, it can start from obviously a variety of reasons from an injury where you might need medication to manage pain that then becomes some sort of an addiction mm -hmm. and, and many many scenarios can you tell us a little bit about addiction and that I think is one of the maybe slightly less common applications or commonly known applications of ketamine therapy ketamine is really remarkable for people who are trying to put the use or overuse of alcohol or opiates, stimulants, or uh, 
tranquilizers behind them. It really helps, ketamine helps to resist cravings. Not that useful in detoxification, but once someone has detoxified, it's very helpful in helping them to maintain the resolve to not go back to these substances. These substances provide real comfort initially. However, they inevitably end up being uh, addictive. And now addiction is pretty complicated and nobody has a really great definition. There are none of these, except for opiates, addictive in the sense that tolerance develops to them. But one does require increasing amounts to achieve the same effect. There's no physiologic tolerance. But people need more benzos as time goes on. They need more alcohol as time goes on. They definitely need more opiates as time goes on to get the same effect. And even so, they don't get the same effect. And they end up pushing their doses higher and higher to get that elusive first-time rush. So that's an important distinction that I don't think many people recognize is the difference between tolerance on a physiological level and tolerance that might be mental, or I don't know what you would call it otherwise, but uh, the alternative way that people will increase quantity or dosage. Yes. You know, addiction is partly a function of the substance. It's partly a function of the person. And uh, context and mindset and setting are super important in determining whether the substance is potentially addictive. We give opiates to people all the time who are recovering from surgery and have pain. The vast majority of those people use their opiates appropriately and stop using them when they no longer need them. Uh, some people have accused ketamine of being addictive. Well, the substance is not addictive, but it does provide comfort for people. And used in a recreational setting or an unsupervised setting, it's possible for people to become very, very attached to ketamine as a source of comfort. Uh, I'll leave it to you to decide if that's addiction or not. I had a mother just two weeks ago come in here with her 24-year-old daughter who really wanted to kill herself. And at the end of our first interview, when we were talking about starting ketamine infusions for the daughter, the mother said, oh, but what if it's addictive? What if she gets addicted to it? Well, this is a girl who really was about to throw herself out of her apartment window. She lived on a high floor. Um, I thought it was a little strange to be that concerned about the future when there wasn't going to be a future without some intervention. Anyway, long story short, uh, Gail had infusions. She really stopped being suicidal. Her depression was relieved. She's now back in her hometown and back at work. This is only a few weeks ago. Uh, she has no craving for ketamine. I haven't had in my 600 plus patients, I have not had anyone have any cravings for ketamine. When I give ketamine lozenges to people, they have control of them at home. They could be diverting them. They could be hoarding them and then taking them all at once. They could be doing a lot of things. None of my patients, to my knowledge so far, have done any of those things. Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, people, I think, uh, maybe exaggerate the abuse of ketamine, not to say that it isn't something that is I guess you could say moderately popular or um, more popular than it was, and people definitely do. Yet, many, many patients in, in the clinic, even those who might find the experience somewhat um, pleasant or interesting, they often make comments like, I could never imagine doing this in a club or out recreationally, or I could never do this just for fun or to get high. It's, it's hard for them to even wrap their heads around why people are uh, are using it in that way. I hear that all the time. People say, this is really transformative. I'm so happy that I'm doing this. I cannot imagine why anyone would do it for fun. It's very common. And I have people who occasionally say, you know what? I could see. I could see why somebody would want to do this for fun. 
but I'm very happy to not do it except when I need it. Set and setting are super important. Ketamine's addiction liability is mostly discussed by people who would like to see patients not receive ketamine as an excuse to avoid offering it. When people are suffering, when people are threatening to take their own lives, to withhold a drug because it might have long-term side effects or it might become addictive is absurd. It's not valid. It's a detractor's argument. So for anyone who might be uh, suffering from uh, or struggling with addiction presently, what would you advise them if they were interested in the possibility of if ketamine might help? Um, what would you tell them to do in terms of first uh, steps towards recovery? Optimally, they should detoxify from the, the drugs they're presently dependent upon. Right. Uh, that isn't always possible, and we do consider taking what we call dual diagnosis patients as a, a, an assist or a bridge to being detoxified. Most of the time, people come here detoxified, and they are looking for greater resolve in resisting their cravings. Ketamine is great for providing assistance in developing that resolve, for making people more intentional, for making people better able to concentrate, better able to focus, better able to say no to the quick and easy solutions they were accustomed to going to. And for those who might say, great, you know, detoxify, yeah, I wish, I would if I could, uh, you might recommend what, like an inpatient facility or program uh, where they could actually go to do that or um, what, what, might, what direction might you send them in? Well, detoxification does occasionally require inpatient management. Sure, and I imagine it depends upon the substance and the degree of addiction or the degree of use uh, and many other factors. That's right. Um, but the physical aspects of detoxification are generally over within a few days. And these long inpatient programs, could, many of these patients could be managed outpatient if they have good supervision. The one thing inpatient does, if it's done well, is keep you separated from the substances that you have a craving for. And that is valuable. Once the physiologic craving is resolved, it's the psychologic craving the sense that you have a problem that this medicine can solve or that this substance can solve and you want to get a hold of this medicine to solve it. That's a matter of therapy and resolve. Ketamine can help you to provide that resolve. It's not a substitute for the talking therapy, for the self-understanding that permits you to stay away from the things that, although providing some comfort, also cause chaos in your life and cause you to move away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Mangano. I think this was a really informative talk today. And um, any, any final thoughts? I know you still have patients here, and Fridays are always kind of hectic, especially this one. And I don't want to keep you any longer. I did want to mention when we were talking about safety that we're seeing an increasing number of adolescent patients and parents are very anguished that maybe they're giving their children a medicine that would harm them or facilitating their children getting a medicine that would harm them. Ketamine is a safe drug. Ketamine is much better for people than contemplating harming themselves. Think about it. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you.